Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Epic Chat today. My name is Jennifer, and I am the head of US development at Epic Foundation. So at Epic, we fight to change the lives of disadvantaged children and youth around the world through our portfolio of high impact organizations, a couple of which will be featured today. But first, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, today's chat will include an opportunity to ask our guests your burning questions during the AMA. So as you think of them, please add them to the questions tab or upvote the ones that you'd love to see. Over to you, Debbie. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you today. My name is Debbie, and I head up Epic in the UK. Today, we're delighted to welcome Ben, who, as many of you will know, is the founding partner at Frega, which is one of the fastest growing VCs in Europe. Ben, of course, is also an Epic pledger. Now, for those of you who don't know, the Epic pledge is for VCs and founders who promise to give a small percent of their carry or equity from an exit to social good. It's not legally binding, so there's no transfers or approvals needed. It's just a promise to yourself that if you succeed, you'll give a little back to, um, to others who are more vulnerable than you are. Very simple, but an effective way to have an impact while staying focused on your business. And of course, you get to join an amazing community of people with us in it, but more importantly, people like Ben. Now, many of you know that at Epic, we're all about giving back. And for each webinar of the series, the speaker has been able to choose one organization from our portfolio of 26 high impact organizations, all of which support underserved children and youth around the world. Now, Ben is such a big fan of the Epic portfolio that he's actually chosen two organizations, one of which is Agile pour l'école, my French, sorry, you have to pardon that, but Agile pour l'école in France, which bridges the reading gap between underserved children and their peers by developing digital apps for teachers. And in the UK, we've got the Brilliant Club, which exists to increase the number of pupils from underrepresented backgrounds, progressing to highly selective universities by mobilizing the PhD community. Now, this week is even more exciting because Ben has chosen to match all donations up to 5K, which is the biggest match we've had so far. So thank you so much, Ben. Um, you'll see a donation link <laughs> up just there. You can click on it, it will take you to a new window, but it won't take you away from the Epic chat. Please give generously because of the match. Um, we know it's more important now, the needs are greater than ever. And as a reminder, 100% of your donations will go to those organizations. So thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you um, yeah, for joining us. And I will hand it back over to you, Jennifer and Ben. Yeah, just, just to echo what Debbie said, thank you again for the really generous match. I mean, it's the largest to date, so really, really appreciate that. And so I really encourage everyone in the room um, to dig a little deeper in your pockets and help these two amazing organizations that are featured. Um, so with that, I want to start with uh, the first question we have for you, Ben. Okay. Um, so you launched your first startup in 20, 2009 which means you were probably developing the idea during the last uh, economic crisis. So would love to hear more. What did you see? What did you experience uh, back then? And how does it compare with what we're seeing these days? Cool. Well, look, first of all, thank you very much for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to share uh, you know, my experience with you all today and uh, hopefully be able to answer your questions, if any. So feel free. Um, and, and second of all, uh, please, donate because you know I'm, I'm matching anything you will donate today so let's do it right well, let's crack the numbers it's the higher match today so you know please just you know smash it with me and make sure that we can help <laughs> others you know in these difficult times so back to you uh, back to your question uh, Jennifer um, I think you know crises are always a good time to think through of, of you know what the world can be after it I think it's always a good moment in life where you usually have a, a, a you know indirect, uh, hopefully, and sometimes direct um, impact on your day-to-day -day, uh, life, and uh, it's a good moment to reflect on you know what counts, what's important, what's not, and how do you want to you know sort of change the world, even at a, at, a, at a little scale. I mean, it doesn't have to be a transform a transformative project anyway, but changing your own world first of all, and then the world of others if you can, right? Um, so back then, you know, I was uh, I've, I've played rugby all my life. I think it, I've been a, you know I come from a region where people play rugby, uh, mm -hmm. don't even know about soccer or, or football, whatever you call it, and it's uh, it's very important. Like it's the, it's the local sport, right? <laughs> and um, and I played rugby all my life at a you know decent level, uh, got paid to play. I wasn't a professional, but you know earned some money through it. Um, mm -hmm. 
and uh, and it was part of me, right? And that was that period in, in my life where, um, for family reasons, I, I traveled back from us from Australia down to well up to to Europe, um, and closer to my family, and and uh, I wanted to do something that sort of really represented who I, I am in in a way, and. Uh, mm -hmm through and I saw you know rugby despite the crisis was a, a booming sport a lot of people getting into it because it has you know amazing values and um, and a, at the same time I realized you could do you know commerce online and, and even distribute brands totally online so it was mm -hmm. a real you know real you know positioning of saying well look there's a growing population a growing number of people who actually love rugby um, these people are usually younger so between 15 to 30, let's say, um, you can sort of, you know, um, get to them through the web and get to them online, um, tomorrow mobile, and, and uh, the vast majority of, of rugby was kind of old England, a bit old fashioned, very traditional brands. So that's how, you know, I, I, I teamed up with, a, with my partner at the time and we came up with this idea of building a, an international brand around, you know, what we uh, live for and what we sort of, you know, say, uh, up at night very late for when you know the games are playing all around the world which is rugby and sort of you know get to our uh, customers and, and rugby fans all around all around the world online and uh, and through mobile um and so i i guess uh the question is you know back then you were building rugby and and despite the economic crisis you know business was good uh folks were coming together to play obviously these days it, you know things look a little bit different I mean, how would you compare the last economic crisis in terms of like an environment for um, creating and, and building a startup versus now? Well, it, it, you know, I think, you know, back in the day, um, I mean, building a, you know, what we call today DNVB, a digital native vertical brand, which wasn't mm. called at that time because it didn't exist as a concept yet. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, the reason for the crisis are very different, right? I mean, you know, Back in the 2000s, it was a tech crisis. People bet on tech, uh, mm. were, while tech wasn't ready yet. I and mean, you know, we were having these forecasts around, mm. people, you know, selling this and that online, but people didn't have a connection, right? I mean, for those of mm. you who remember of modems, you know, 55Ks, you're like, well, it was pretty crappy, right? So, uh, so that's why it was a tech crisis, and that's why tech suffered so much. Because mm. the idea of what we could build with tech didn't really exist because the mm. the, pipe, the pipes you know were non existent. Um, mm -hmm. Two thousand and eight is a different one. It's a financial crisis. It's, it's actually you know coming from a space where for various different reasons you know finance as an as an industry failed and so drawn the world into a crisis. Therefore, tech wasn't really oh you know, it got impacted like any other industry. But the, the biggest hit was the financing of it, because obviously, you know, mm. tech at the beginning to build your brand, to build your tech, to build your uh, barriers, your entry, you need capital. And in a financial crisis, you know, capital go, gets scarce in, in general. And so it's much more complicated to build a startup at a point where you're in a, in a, in a financial crisis. The major difference with today is that it's, it's neither a tech crisis nor a financial crisis yet. Mm it's a, a sanitary crisis, right? So it has nothing to do with both of them. And you see in a lot of cases, you know, tech is even part of the solution rather than the problem. I mean, if you look at what the conversation we're having today, without mm. tech, it wouldn't be happening, right? So tech allowed a lot of people to work from home, to still sort of, you know, um, buy food and, and, and other stuff online, to sort of get education online, to sort of mm -hmm. get entertainment online, so, um, so in a way, I think you know, tech is benefiting from from the crisis we are at, unfortunately, because you know, obviously, some people die. We have to keep this in mind. But somehow, the tech industry provides a way to uh, to solve the problem. Having mm. said that, you know, it's such a big issue um, that although there's still a lot of capital available, will it last forever? This I'm not sure of. Right? I think you know. Um, mm. Tech needs capital at the beginning. Uh, funds were raised, you know, uh, in the previous year. So a lot of you know VCs or investors still have capital to deploy, but you know they haven't yeah. been they haven't been raising money for the last uh, six or nine months since you know right. we got the first lockdowns back in March. Uh, yeah. they able to raise money early next year, I'm not sure of. So we may have a gap of you know twelve to mm. eight months 
with people not being able to raise money for their funds. And once again, it's a food chain, right? So if you don't have money from mm. investors, you know, the startups cannot thrive. So then right. we may get to a point where there's less money for the tech ecosystem in the future because of mm. that gap from mm. 2021. Um, and I'm not sure we're going to we're gonna see a total catch up, right? There, there might be a catch up, but will people be able mm -hmm. to raise later on what, what they haven't raised in 2021? This I'm not totally sure of. Right, right. Let's dig a little bit deeper on that. So uh, Brega, uh, the name of your fund, uh, is actually short for Bridging the European Equity Gap. And it's focused on fueling startups across uh, Europe in a variety of sectors. And so uh, the question here is, you know, what are you seeing uh, in the European VC market in particular? How do you see COVID, you know, impacting uh, the space that you're looking at? Um, and, you know, uh, what you just shared with us, do you, do you see that being uh, applicable um, uh, to the same degree with, with the European markets that you're looking at? Well, definitely. And, you know, you know once again, I think, you know, tech is very centric auto centric so you know obviously mm. they have you know we you know tech has customers and and you know they're not only tech people right so you have to go right. whether you go b2c or b2b whatever your you know uh, clients are um mm. they still have to be you know open and 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 um still have the resources to to partner with you and buy your products whether you're b2c or b2b uh, company so the um the underlying crisis, which is actually hitting bars and restaurants and, you know, aviation and, and tourism uh, mm -hmm. may hit startups at the end, right? Because, you know, I know a lot of companies that were actually selling, you know, software to uh, uh, av aviation company. Well, then all of a sudden you're, wow, you know, you're, you're facing a problem where, of course, the tech ecosystem is fine and you still have, you know, help from governments and, and subsidies and stuff, but your underlying mm -hmm client base or underlying partners are in a situation which is which is really bad so i think crisis will hit rather this way than you know uh, the other way around therefore what do i see as a potential for uh, for investments i think once again it's not a tech crisis but it's not a tech revolution either like we haven't discovered anything new it's not like back in the 2000 and eight where at the same time that you know we hit the crisis the iphone was out or seven the iphone was out and we started having internet and you know in our mobile and everyone got you know a connection mm -hmm. on a day-to-day -day basis 24 hours a day right uh, that was mm -hmm. a, a massive change i think today there's not a particular change in terms of tech so we're not going to see a, a major difference but we're going to see an acceleration of what was happening right and if i look uh, if I take one example in my personal case, I think you know my dad, mm. for example, who I who's 67 now. Hey, hey, dad. Um, <laughs> you no, know, it, it took him forever to sort of be able to do a video call with me, right? Pre-COVID, mm. pre mm -hmm. pre and now he's the king of video calls. And right? he video calls me on WhatsApp, on Google Meet, <laughs> and he loves it, right? So it's it's not that you know there's a new piece of tech. It's just that tech is accelerating a trend, and and the trend got yeah. accelerated by by COVID. So obviously anything that allows you to work remote is a big thing, you know, because we're going to have to work remotely more and more. Mm -hmm. Anything around education, you know, remote and remote education is a big thing as well, because we mm -hmm. realize that, you know, pupils and, and, and youngers don't have to be at school to learn. That's one big thing. And that's why I chose to, uh, to back to, uh, to, uh, um, NGOs around education today, and we can discuss that later. Um, Love it. Mm -hmm. Health as well is, is, is a big thing. Obviously, how can you provide health and, and care as a whole to people who are at home? And, you know, there was already this issue of, you know, how do you care, you know, um, of, of elder people, you know, alone in, in their house? Um, it's even bigger today, right? Because, you know, they, they, you have more people alone in their home and, and how do you care to these people? How do you make sure that they're not set apart of, of the society and that they're still part of, of, of the world we live together? Um, yeah. So there's this bunch of things, right? It's, it's just accelerating and being sure that we have solutions for all of this because the world is going to change. It's not going to change dramatically. Uh, I mean, you know, if you look at SARS back in the 2000s, uh, you know, mm. in, yeah, the world didn't change dramatically. It's just people changed the way they, they were living on a day-to-day -day basis slightly. And I'm sure that tech can enhance all of these different you know, behaviors. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing. Actually, on the topic of 
uh, kind of looking towards the future, uh, I know one of your uh, investments before the pandemic hit um, was in a portfolio company called Exotech. Uh, I think it's based in France, right? Yep. Um, and it's an e-commerce warehouse of the future uh, type startup. Uh, they, they have these robots literally called Skypods uh, that can move in 3D at about four meters per second. Um, and so, you know, you were crazy enough to invest in hardware before, it, you know, really became a thing. Um, and now they've kind of uh, celebrated their their recent Series C raise. So, how did you spot that um, trend? I guess back then, and and do you see similar investments uh, in that space in the future? Well, look, definitely. I think it was. Um... It was a um, a pretty bold move back in the day. I think you know we were at the beginning of Briga, uh, investing in hardware, which usually VCs hate. Um, in a very early stage company, right? They barely had a a a, mm. a, um, a prototype. Like, well, they literally didn't have a prototype of the actual business they do today, right? So it was very, you know, visionary in the sense that we had to take a lot of you know, a big risk and trust the team to be able to deliver on their plan. The good thing we had for us is that, you know, we looked at the trend and thought, well, A, there's an automation trend in anything, right? So a lot of people are, are talking about, you know, software is a thing, um, AI is a thing, and, you know, even in in, in day-to-day lives, most sort of um, operational, like, you know, physical jobs, you know, robotics has been a thing, right? Robotics has been, you know, mm-hmm. in, in, plants and you know changing the industry for quite a while now and it's right. pushing the, it's pushing the boundaries thanks to software basically right so thanks mm-hmm. to software you can do the exotech you can do the udelves which is one of our other companies that do sort of you know autonomous delivery trucks you can push mm-hmm. the boundaries of what you can automate because tech is getting more powerful and so the idea in exotech was to say well look there's a huge trend of e-commerce and 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 online e-commerce and therefore management of warehouses is still fairly manual is there a way to sort of automate this as much as possible and mm-hmm. the, the funny thing is i had my experience of rugby division and therefore i knew how cumbersome and old-fashioned you know warehouses could be so mm-hmm. when, mm-hmm. We met, when we met this guy i was like you know wow clicked on like it, it's 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 incredible right and that's something that really 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 uh, impressed us at the time and uh, and uh, mm-hmm. look, it was a good bet, but you do, sometimes you, could, you, you do good ones and sometimes you do bad, bad ones and hopefully you do more goods than bads and that's what it is. Yeah, exactly. Well, congrats on that bet. Obviously it paid off, no pun intended. Um, but uh, I want to segue to the, the AMA section. Um, and so if anyone has questions, please again, add them to the questions tab. Uh, so one that's really popular uh, is uh, actually a question that I think you've already answered. It's, you know, what industries do you think will will grow in the n- next few years? So, you know, you mentioned future of work, you mentioned, you know, elderly care, you mentioned, um, you know, sort of uh, robotics and, and what that holds. So let me go down to uh, the second most popular question, which is actually a really great one. It's um, what tips do you have for founders to help them get the attention of VCs? So how can they get in front of you and, and the Briga team? That's a good one. Um, look, I think a lot of people, my, my take on this is that a lot of people forget that um, raising money is a sales exercise, right? Um, mm. And being an entrepreneur is actually a sales exercise, right? So I mean, you, you sell your idea and your capital to investors, uh, you sell your products to clients, you sell your vision to employees and people who join the team and, and you want to attract the best talents. So you really have to be a salesperson, right? Like if you don't like this, wow, you're in trouble. Right? It's, it's, it's a big part of it. If you don't, you don't, you know what I mean? Not everyone in the team has to have it, but if it's a, you're a solo founder, you have to have it. And if you're a you know, mm-hmm. multiple founders team, at least someone in the team needs to have this, right? And so, you know, raising money, as I said, is a sales exercise. Therefore, you really have to think how do you approach a sales exercise in front of an investor like any other client, right? So mm-hmm. know about your investor as, 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 as much as you can to sort of try to figure out what will sort of, you know, turn them on or not. Um, mm-hmm. You know, uh, try to get 
an intro to them. You know, obviously, you know, if I get an introduced to someone, or you know, if someone get in, it gets introduced to me uh, through someone I know and I respect, you know, the level of interaction is much higher. Um, mm -hmm. Come and, and and pick my attention with something you know that's not the sort of regular kind of pitch. So, uh, you know. Um, Ooh, what's an example? I don't know. I think you know. Look, back in the day, it's funny. You know, like ten years ago, I think you know, um, investors were sort of you know sitting in their uh, in their ivory tower smoking cigars, and it was really hard to approach them. I think nowadays you have live mm -hmm. events and webinars like this one, and, and and so there's multiple ways of getting in touch mm -hmm. with investors, right? So, uh, but you mm -hmm. have to bear in mind that I mean, you know, we receive close to 8,000 opportunities a year at Briga, right? So that's that's a mm. big number. So if you want to stand out, you know, just find a way, like any t typical sales pitch, right? So introduction is a big one. Face-to-face um, -face meeting at an event or during a, a webinar is a big one. Um, having a, a sort of, you know, 30 seconds and a two-minute pitch ready just in case and, mm. come, and come up with something that's, you know, big and different, right? I think, you know, uh, a lot of people forget that ultimately the VC game, and it's not a game for every company, and you know, um, I, I really want to stress this, I, I really respect every entrepreneur and people who get VC money are not better than the other ones, but if you want to play the VC game, it has to be a big game, right? You have to become a big company because we, you know, our model, uh, we're not a bank, we don't take interest rates on our loans, we invest money mm -hmm. in, in, in equity and we expect major returns because a bunch of what we invest in will die for various different reasons. And so we want to make sure that we multiply this money enough that we can, you know, um, counterbalance the, the failures and, and you know, create value to our own investors because we are uh, we have our own investors. So mm -hmm. come up with something big and, and ambitious and something that's uh, that's uh, visionary uh, to me at least. Um, you know, uh, help me uh, help me make a decision. Great. Well, hopefully those are some clues for the founders in the audience. Um, let me pull another one from uh, Pack. So Ben, how do you see the VC slash PE world evolving in these COVID times? Are they being shy? Are they being bold? Are you cutting more or less checks these days? What are you seeing? <laughs> Look, it's, it's a good one. I think, um, well, A, first of all, going back to my previous point, you have VCs who have money and VCs who don't have money, right? And for all mm. the ones who unfortunately for them were sort of, you know, um, ending up their investment period of the previous fund and were thinking of raising or closing a new fund now, Mm -hmm. It's complicated, right? Timing's like off, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, like like anything in business, I think timing is key. And, and here, I think, you know, for people who are closing their funds now, it's going to be complicated, unfortunately. Um, for the other ones, I think there are opportunities. And, and a lot of uh, investors I know are still investing. And we at Briga are still investing. Um, maybe the difference is the process. Maybe it's, you know, it's a little bit... It's a little more cranky in, in the sense that, you know, video calls are not as good as as face-to-face uh, mm. -to -face meetings, just in a right. very, just for a simple reason, right? I think, you know, face-to-face, -face, uh, video calls are, su are super great when you when you know, already know people because you know how they react, you know, mm. uh, you know, I, it's funny, a lot of people, uh, you know, told me um, recently, you know, I, I, I thought you were taller, or I thought you were smaller, or I thought you were bigger, or I thought <laughs> <laughs> you don't actually realize, you know, what people so are you're watching. an eight-foot rugby player, right? <laughs> Too bad you're only seven. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and this is super important in, in investment. Right? And in the investment mm -hmm. world, you yeah. have to trust people, right? I mean, you know, you're going to sign yeah. that check for the next ten years, and you you cannot pull it up. I think you know it's yeah. like you know, it's not like you even when you recruit someone, it's complicated. But when yeah. you recruit someone, you recruit one person on one role, and if things don't work, you can you know set apart. Whereas you know once you invest. Mm -hmm. It's multiple people on a vision, on a company, on a tech. Right, for multiple months, years. For multiple mm. years. And once, you, once your money's in, it's right. in. You cannot say just right. and say, well, look, well, finally, I'm going to take mm. it back. You cannot do this, right? So the okay. whole of investment is a little longer, I'd say. So here's a, here's a really brief follow-up to, to that question. Uh, Pre-COVID, had you ever cut a check just by meeting founders virtually? And during COVID, have you cut a check just by meeting them virtually? That's a good one. Um, Pre-COVID, once, I think, but it was, mm, a very, okay. it was a very small check. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we were backing Techstars launching their program in Africa. And therefore, 
you know, we want you to be supportive and help. And so we cut a check to uh, African entrepreneurs without meeting them at the time. So that's mm, got the, it. But it was a and now during COVID. During COVID, we haven't yet to be totally fair. Yes. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. We are about to, so we may have one on a on a big check, so that may happen, but we haven't yet. And just you know, full disclosure, I know I know a lot of investors sort of you know bragged around the fact that they had signed deals, you know, in COVID times without seeing people. The reality is that you know, if you know how investment works, you know, mm -hmm. if, if you close a deal ten days post lockdown, it means that you have you know started conversations before lockdown. So okay, it was right. closed. It was closed during lockdown, but it was initiated before, and probably there was a face-to-face -face meeting before then, right? So right, right. So let's Good not point. Get, yeah, let's not get you know trapped and and and, and confused by uh, by this. So yep. um, so yes, but we have one that yes should be you know closed in uh, in a couple of Great. days now. We'll look out for the headlines. Thank you. So let me pull one from uh, Alexandre. Um, he is asking where where does your willingness to help the underserved come from? Wow, uh, that's that's a big one. Look, it, it's just because I, um, I I I just I just believe in the e e equality of chances in a way, um, mm. and that, you know it may sound very French, but it's um, I um, yeah I'm a competitor. I've been mean, you know, playing rugby. I'm an entrepreneur, so I like you know uh, well tough stuff apparently, and uh, and. Uh, and, and, and I'm happy, you know, to, to realize people who uh, overperform or who get, you know, retributed for their performance. That's totally fine, mm -hmm. as long as they have the same chances at the beginning. And, mm -hmm. and and I realize a lot of people don't. And yeah. well, you're not comparing apples with apples, right? You're saying, well, look, okay, well, you know, they should work there more or they should earn more and, and don't complain. But you're like, well, they didn't quite start on the same line as you, right? So you can't really compare. Like if we were on the same line. And then they chose not to work, or they underperform. Then okay, we you can compare, right? But giving mm -hmm. everyone these chances is for me something very important. And I realize, um, you know, um, Europe especially was very much like that up until recently. I think that the different crises have hit the the social European system, and obviously for the last ten years, I think people are not receiving or having exactly the same chances. And I really want to fight for this, right? And and going back to the uh, to yeah. the NPOs and I wanted to support. I think you know, it's it's very Maslowian in a way. Like you need you know you need food, you need a shelter, and then health, and then education. Because with education mm -hmm. you can do everything, right? So yeah. um, but, so shelter is usually pretty well covered by government, more or less. Let's say could be better, but it could be worse. At least in Europe. Um, you know, food is still okay-ish, although, you know, there's still a, a lot of work to be done. And, and unfortunately, we see a lot of European people who don't eat, who don't eat sorry, as, as much as they should. But finally, mm -hmm. it's education. I think, you know, if people understand, if they know, if they have the same chances, well, you can you can pretty much build engineers or, or managers in every class of society, which was the case back in the 60s and the 70s. I think if you look at, you know, the number of people who were sons and daughters of you know farmers or sons and daughters of of, of, um, of my, I mean, people working in plants and, and all this um, it's unfortunately changing and, and and this I want to fight for because I think it's unfair then you know once people have the same chance if they don't want to work that's their choice and you know uh, I'm okay to support the ones who do but but up until that point I think we should have the same chances I love that I love that and I I think you just answered the the last question I had planned, which is why you decided to sign the Epic Pledge and and sort of get your team involved as well. And so I I love your your commitment and your fight to help others uh, start on the same starting line. So I love that. Um, but I, I also want to give you the the chance, I guess, to to talk a little bit more about uh, Brega's decision to sign. So you're not the only partner that has signed there. Uh, we were fortunate enough that uh, you know there there are more folks on your team that kind of believed in this greater vision. And so, what does you know the Epic Pledge? What does social impact mean to to your team? Well, look, it, it's super important to us. I think it's part of our values. I think at, at Briga, our three core values are entrepreneurship, collaboration, and care. Right. That that's what they are. Right. And 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 mm -hmm. care in terms of caring of of our team members, caring you know of our uh, 
of our entrepreneurs and founders and clients, obviously, and, and caring for the world. And, and I mean, you know, we're like, okay, we work in finance. We can try to invest in more or less impactful projects anyway. We're going to create a lot of financial value. How can we create, you know, social value? And so when we started Briga, it was even before, you know, meeting Alexander and, 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 and signing into Epic, we decided to give a, a, a chunk of our current interest for NGOs. And we had mm. conversation with, with Epic and stuff, and we said, okay, well, you know, we're happy to to do it through Epic for our new funds and try to convince other VCs to do it as well, because to us, it was so obvious, right? I mean, mm. it's a big chunk of money, but it was like important for the whole team and all the partners at Briga and everyone who's joined since then to, to be able to say, well, look, we're fighting hard to make money, but at the same time, we're fighting hard to give money back to society and to give money back to the ones who need it. So uh, we sort of align interest with, you know, our vision of the world and the work we do on a day to day basis and going back to performance and, and being a fighter. I think, you know, I'm happy to fight mm -hmm. for myself, but for others as well. And, and that's a good way of doing it. Well, it's an honor to fight alongside you. And, and thanks for being one of our earliest pledgers and sort of champions for for the epic pledge. Um, and so with that, uh, sorry, I'm going to go a, a couple minutes over this conversation with Ben was just too great uh, to cut short. Um, but to all our viewers, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, again, don't forget to donate to either or both of the amazing organizations that uh, Ben is, uh, has featured today. So Agripol Coal in France and the Brilliant Club in the UK. Um, also, all of you are invited to a special one hour event uh, called Epic Live 2020. Uh, it's spotlighting innovation-driven social impact trends, including a really cool panel on narrowing the digital divide. So Ben, a lot, you know, it, it kind of dovetails uh, to, to everything we talked about with education. So join us if you can. The English version is on November 12th. French version is on November 19th. It's in the chat window. So please go and register. Um, also, one last favor. Uh, you might have just seen the, the pop-up for it. But uh, if you stay for an extra five seconds after the webinar ends, you'll see our very cool Super Bowl commercial uh, about the Epic Pledge. Um, we're really uh, awesome gang with amazing people like Ben who are doing incredible uh, amounts of good while building uh, amazing businesses. So please join us, check out the Epic Pledge, and uh, you can contact us at epicpledge at epic.foundation. Um, so with that, thank you again, Ben, and we hope to see all of you at Epic Live 2020. Luke, it was a real pleasure. Thank you very much. Please donate and see you soon. Yes.